I'm going to go through three different approaches uh, for the same portrait. On this one, I'm going to do a simple and fun approach, or at least relatively simple, um, that involves basically line and cross hatching. So um, I'm going to use a uh, the basic idea of just kind of tracing out um, a portrait, kind of working from some of the larger forms and surface landmarks, and then work my way down into the smaller forms. And uh, because I've kind of done this a lot, I kind of know where to overlap um, forms and uh, which lines go over which. Um, and what you're trying to, to look for here is anytime that a form changes direction, that's where you need to indicate that with a, with a line. So you're using line kind of loosely here, and you're kind of trying to figure out, you know, potentially where these where these forms are, how they might overlap, and the nice thing about working this way is you can work kind of gesturally, kind of loosely, um, go at it with a bunch of energy, and um, that energy is going to kind of translate into your uh, into your drawing, whether you want it to or not. Um, and when you do this, you know any kind of anatomy that you know, you can work on adding that into your into your drawing and you can kind of use lines to follow forms you can um, use cross contours to help you define how forms progress in space and so on um, I'm a big fan of using cross contours to describe form early on in the drawing process because that kind of just sets the tone for what you're going to do later um, and you know, I like to work on some of the larger structures. And when I'm doing a kind of tracing thing like this, um, I want to be sure not to be like too addicted to the image. Just like when you have a model in front of you, you're not really interested in, in the model and getting a likeness of the model. You're interested in the end in getting an interesting drawing. And, you know, insofar as, um, you know, the model is only useful uh, to you to get a decent drawing. So when you go through it, that should be your main focus, you know, getting the result that you want, or at least a happy accident, something that you didn't expect that you that you like anyway. Um, so when I keep turning off the reference and turning it back on, um, you know, I kind of can tell where my drawing is going and if I and if I like it. And what I like about working quickly and gesturally is that you know really early on, in about a couple of minutes, I already know where this drawing is going, um, and I know um, that I kind of enjoy the line work here. So um, I don't like to trace everything completely all the way through. Um, I only like to do that just to kind of get that um, uh, get that gesture set up. So what I'll do is I'll move these images apart, kind of keep them in line with each other if I can, and um, then just use them as a reference for each other. So now that I've done that, I can kind of work separately. And I may even want to kind of um, crop that layer's contents. If that's possible. No, that's a transformation.
So what I think I can do is select the contents of this layer here and then delete it. Yeah. Perfect. So now I can kind of get this layer more where I want it. Nice thing about Art Rage is it's pretty flexible. So, um, I like this this uh, photo as as copy because it really shows off the form. Um, the you can see um, if I kind of change the color here and draw on the photo with a new layer. Um, the the form you know, as it changes, has a, di has a distinct value change right on the corner of the form. You know, you can see the outline of the nose because there's a value change from point A to point B here. Um, you can see the form shift along the cheekbone and all that. And that's what I look for in a, um, in a reference photo. So what I can do is come over to my drawing that I've already started and begin to um, work into the into the forms. And if you've drawn a lot of box forms, you know that uh, that when you draw a box to make it seem like forms go back in space, all you have to do is follow the form. And you can do that on both sides. And then when you cross hatch, you can go in another direction and that can help you create a sense of depth and you can so you use you wind up using a lot of line work to create that depth so I can do the same thing with a uh, with a portrait as long as I can imagine from the two-dimensional how three-dimensionally these forms proceed back in space so um, I will add another layer here to do this so that I can turn it off later. But basically I'll start going in and start indicating some progression. And as the as this form bends around the eye, I'll change the direction. And I can go through the entire kind of dark side of the portrait and do this. Now, the classical way of rendering is to do something called 60 degree hatching. Um, and this is kind of developed in the, in the French Academy where um, every line, when it crosses another, goes at a 60 degree angle. And you don't have to be that formulaic anymore. You know, drawing is much more free now. Um, you don't have anybody to answer to as far as an academy. As far as an academy. So you can kind of do whatever mark making system that you want. It doesn't matter. Um, and the mark making system that you develop is going to kind of be your personal signature. So right here in the nose, I'm kind of doing some 60 degree hatching. Um, I'm going to back off those details and kind of go back to laying out some hatching um, in a more structured way. Or go back into the into the structures rather than into the details. You'll find eventually that you kind of get limited with straight hatching and you'll probably want to start involving some round hatching. At first what you can do is change the, evolve the direction of the straight hatching as you go, right? So it kind of, the angle changes. Um, and then eventually you'll want to include some actual round hatching, which is where you curve the hatch mark. And you'll notice if you go back and look at Renaissance old masters that um, most of them begin with straight hatching, involve some round hatching um, mixed in with straight hatching, and then go to all round hatching later in their careers. Um, and I think that's just because as they got a command of it that they were more and more comfortable using the round hatching method as time went along.
and you know there's there are some formulas for this or some recommendations but these are all just tools and if you feel like you need to do uh, do this a little differently and apply the marks differently then go for it um, the formulas are only useful insofar as you need them if you don't need them or you want to modify them that's totally fine um, so if I turn off the under layer, you kind of see some forms getting described already, right? Um, and another thing that I like to do is uh, zoom out. And if you zoom out and the analog equivalent is stepping six feet back from your piece, you can kind of see how the forms are progressing. And overall, they're kind of, they're working okay so far. So I'll go back into my normal zoom level and continue on with that. Now I've got on the nose, I've, got, I've already got some marks established going backward in space along this plane of the nose. And then here I've got the direction change for the nostril, but it's a little darker there so I can actually start to cross hatch by using, by combining those two directions. And then here, um, there's a bit of curve to the nose, so I can I can do a little round hatching uh, under the bottom of the nose. I can do a little bit of round hatching to cross it to help describe the form. I can do some round hatching around the contour of the nose to kind of make that look a little better, make it a little more evolved. And eventually, what happens when you do do hatching like this is you start to create a sense of value. Right? which is good it gives you a sense of uh, a little bit of a sense of light but that's not really what we're doing with round hatching what we're looking for with with hatch marks is to describe form and that's our main goal and if we're if we're getting to a sense of light that's just kind of a bonus it's not really necessary and you know, if you have something like eyebrows, you can use the direction of the hair follicle growth as a suggestion for how these lines might progress. So we're not really doing like a value drawing here per se, but what we are doing is using areas of deep value to kind of help us describe some of the forms. So again, if we keep zooming out, we can kind of see that the forms are developing. And we're, we're losing some of the initial gesture as we build up these forms. But that's OK, um, because they'll come back later. You know, here around the cheek, I might use some round hatching to get to the form as it bends around softly. Um, might have to go into the, in between the lips here and start to bump down the teeth and the value between the lips. And I can use some cross contour to kind of develop some areas around the lips. Lips are a very good spot to begin to play around with round hatching, I think. Same thing with around the mouth, because these curves are so dramatic. Um, and Essentially, if you've done a lot of object drawing, you're not going to have a lot of trouble figuring out how to do this hatching stuff. Because if you've drawn objects, you kind of have probably explored how form works on its own. And now what we're doing is we're applying that knowledge of form into the human figure.
So generally when you do this, you kind of want to stay out of the light areas. So in any light area, mo for the most part, I would not touch it. And if you're going to, I would touch it with only single direction hatching. Don't do, um, don't cross hatch in any area where you see where there's obvious light. Um, because that's just going to make everything a little bit too heavy. Now we're going to come back later and we're going to, you know, find the contours for everything again. So don't worry if you're losing, um, if you're losing the outline of a particular form, um, you know, because generally speaking, outline is not really what we're interested in. With hair, a lot of always a lot of questions about hair. How do I draw hair? So what I like to do is kind of group it into clumps. So there's a hair clump here, right? And this clump has a dark value here and it's got a highlight and then a dark value up here. It's easy to deal with that clump. It's hard to deal with the entire hair. So what I tried to do is break it down into simpler sections. I know how to deal with simpler sections. That's not tough. But dealing with all the hair all at once, I think you, anyone would get overwhelmed. And with this linear approach, it's just a lot of kind of muscular effort, basically, you know, elbow grease. And the hair is going to give you the, the direction of your marks pretty readily. It's just going to be a, a lot of marks. And you can still, under the hair, kind of go back in and describe some forms. Wherever you kind of see shadows. So, at any rate, if we back out again, you can kind of see we've got some dark values anchored, um, but you can see there are some like weird dead spots where we could bump some things up, right? Especially over here in this right eye where we could where we could get some of use the uh, the upper eyelash to kind of get some value. involved. Same thing, we're dealing with another just, we're just dealing with another group of hair right here, right? You can see some deep values behind that in the upper part of the eyelid, so we can push those back down. And we can again go back with some filler to kind of transition. We can start to Add a third direction for hatching. Bump down the pupils. Be sure we've crossed hatch out for most of the eye. Make sure we're adding enough like detail in the flesh. Kind of reobserve as we go through. Um, you know, I think anytime you kind of notice something that you didn't notice in the gesture or notice something where you need to make another as you make another pass through I think it's fine just to go ahead and start adding details that you missed um, and you can always do that at any stage so if you need to change something about the value um, in the very end stages that's fine go, go ahead and do it if you need to change the gesture at this point go ahead and do it you know, as soon as you see something that, that you should have done and didn't do, you you know, there's no reason to, like, sit there and wait um, when you can just go ahead and take care of it. And hair is a good place to practice flow and, you know, practice having line work that kind of evolves elegantly over long distances. 
And, you know, the interesting thing about this kind of like linear approach is that, you know, your emphasis is on the line here, right? Um, and so it's just going to be this overwhelming, you know, conglomeration of lines. And as you go back in to some of the smaller forms, you, know, you start to do a little round hatching. It's all going to kind of smooth out, and it's going to look um, kind of like you want it eventually. As you increase the density of line in the darks, that that line is going to start to feel like tone, right? And it's going to feel less and less like individual lines that are just kind of overwhelming you, right? One of the things that I like to do with the density of the line is focus on the shadow core, right? Which is the darkest part of the shadow, which is almost always like right at that point where the transition from light to dark happens. So if I look for that, I know where to concentrate my efforts and concentrate the density of the line because that's going to describe most of the form for me. And remember, I'm going to show you a couple other other approaches to to how to, you know, potentially how you could approach a portrait. Um, and each one has advantages and disadvantages, and each one gets a different result. Um, and you can kind of pick and choose what you want depending on the uh, the idea that you have in mind for your piece. Um, again, zooming out, you know, I think things are getting a little bit more comfortable, but there's still some kind of dead stuff in the right eye, right? It doesn't, it hasn't like kind of popped to life the way that you want, that you want it to. I think it's because there's so much, um, dead space around the white of the eye there, and it's not really differentiated from the area around it. So I want to be sure that I kind of go in and do that before progressing too much further. Remember the eye itself is a sphere so you want to be sure to kind of indicate that and not just focus over focus on the iris and pupil and the flesh around the eye. So zooming out again, things are kind of going along pretty good. And I think if I switch gears and go back in and pick up some of the contour, what that's going to do is help me define some of the form. So working digitally, I like to add another layer. Um, and I can kind of zoom out and, and get a sense for where I want that contour to be. Right? I don't think I need a contour to... to get this right cheekbone going, but I think um, the nose on the far side might help. I might need to do some work around the lips. So um, a little bit of contour goes a really long way. And what I look for in this is areas of high value contrast, right? Um, and I can always, if I don't like a particular area, I can always um, erase and change, and I can always look into the value that I've created next to that and kind of bump up the hatching in this layer, and that'll kind of help things um, along. This, I believe, is called binding, where you go through and you redefine some of the boundaries, some of the edges of forms that you lost through the drawing process. And what we're looking for is a variety of line weights. Um, we're looking for some skinny lines, some heavy lines. And essentially what we're doing is kind of just punching up the drawing in the end. Going in, making sure that the eyes are kind of rounded. And I can go in and get some anatomical detail going if I want. Um, 
the lips definitely need a bit of work, right, for some definition. So I'm just going to work in real subtly there, try to find the outer contour of it. And then as when I find the outer contour, I kind of want to go back and just be sure that I'm that I'm relating that to, to the form work that I did. Because this, is, this should all kind of like lock up and link together by the time that I finish it. So again, in these late stages, keep zooming out. Keep looking at what you've done and anything that jumps out at you and bugs you, you know, it's worth going ahead and fixing, right? The lack of value on the nose kind of bugs me. So I feel like that's a little bit better now. The lack of value above the lip here is kind of bugging me. It's looking a little, it was looking a little too mustache-like. And then this area is kind of just undefined and blank. So adding a little hatching there will help. So now I think the nose and lips kind of have their their forms defined at this point. So that's good. Um, not totally satisfied with the uh, left side of the lip down here. So I can kind of work into that and make some changes. And I can push some of the contour of the lip into the into the value below it. That can kind of help things along. Yeah, that's looking a little bit better. I like the way that uh, on the left side of the eye there's some value going on behind it in the in the reference photo and that's kind of relating to the hair so I kind of want to bring that in just for a certain level of contrast and then where it drifts off I want to come back and get kind of define that the way that the forms overlap again And then bind the chin, find the edge there without getting too heavy with it. Um, yeah, so I mean as far as a, as as far as like a quick portrait study, um, I think this kind of this kind of works, uh, you know. You can take this kind of idea and develop it as as much as you want. You know, some people will kind of take this really far, um, this approach. But you know, at this point, I like the way that the forms have developed. You can kind of see most of the anatomy, and you know, if I turn off the reference photo layer, you know, I'm left with a drawing. And in a way, I think a drawing is, you know, much more interesting than the actual portrait itself, the photo. So um, we'll do. I'll do a couple more demos. I'll show you two more approaches uh, with this exact same image, and um, you can kind of get a feel for what you might choose for your project.